Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the public lecture organized by the Antiquities and Monuments Office. Today's topic is using remote sensing and geoarchaeological methods to characterize and date Hong Kong Asian Montana terraces. Please note that this lecture will be conducted in English. We are most grateful to have Professor Sam Turner, Director of the McCord Center for Landscape, Newcastle University, Dr. Tim Kinari, Research Officer in the School of Earth Science at St. Andrews University, and Dr. Mick Arthur, Marie Skotoska, Curly Research Fellow in the School of History, Classics, and Archaeology at Newcastle University as our speakers for today's program. Okay. Our speakers are going to share with you some results of their preliminary findings and recent fieldwork on the research project which aimed at studying the boulder facing cultivation terrace in Hong Kong on the Hong Kong Heights Mountain by applying an innovative GIS-based interdisciplinary approaches. Let's give a warm welcome to our speaker, uh, Dr. McArthur, Professor Sam Turner, and Tim Kinnery. Um, so, yeah, so we're in Hong Kong uh, uh, for this collaboration, uh, with research collaboration with the Antiquities and Monuments Office, um, looking at Hong Kong's uh, upland historic landscapes, in particular the high mountain terraces, of which there are many thousands in Hong Kong. Okay, this is not working. It was earlier, but it's not now. <laughs> okay, thank you. So here's uh, just an overview of the uh, the structure of today's talk. So we will begin by uh, pres providing some background to the project and why we think this is uh, an important piece of research that needs to happen. Um, uh, setting out the research rationale, the reasoning behind it. Um, Sam will then present um, the wider research context. So the work we're doing in Hong Kong is one project of many that is happening within uh, many teams of people that Sam is involved with as a kind of, at a supervisory kind of management level. Uh, and these are projects happening all over the Mediterranean, into Arabia, into Africa. So that will set the scene for the work we're doing in Hong Kong, give it a wider context. I will then talk about uh, my particular project, which has got this rather clumsy acronym, CADACOL, which stands for Characterizing and Dating Hong Kong's Upland Historic Landscapes. Um, so I'll talk uh, around the, uh, the project methodology and the approach we're using in this research in Hong Kong. And then Tim will, uh, Tim Kinnaird will then talk about the, the kind of scientific methodology that is allowing us to attempt to date these upland landscapes, which so far we have no firm dating evidence for them. Uh, there are some very broad historical references to tea growing in the Qing Dynasty, but that is not been tested archaeologically. So this is archaeological research uh, combined with uh, geosciences um, to use this technique called optically stimulated luminescence profiling and dating, OSLPD for short, uh, that should allow us to date the construction, use, and abandonment of different terraces up in the mountains. And then we'll give a brief presentation based on the first few days of fieldwork, which we did last week, uh, with the help of our colleagues from the Antiquities and Monuments Office, who've been coming out in the field uh, and helping us with the work. Some initial findings and what the implications of those findings might be. So here's Hong Kong. This is many people's kind of uh, image of the city, uh, looking from the peak, where Sam and Tim just uh, ran to the top of the peak this morning. They like to go running, they do it every morning before we then climb up mountains to do field work. I don't know where they get the energy from. Um, this is many people's vision of Hong Kong, the metropolis, the urban metropolis, looking from the peak across to Kowloon. In the background, we can see some of the, the high hills of Hong Kong. So we have, um, Hong Kong is a place um, which is this intensively developed and redeveloped uh, metropolis. Um, it has quite a frag fragmented historic urban landscape in the built-up areas. So there's been a lot of loss of historic buildings, just the kind of nicest or the biggest or the government buildings have survived. 
Um, but 76% of the territory of Hong Kong, even today, uh, is rural and relatively undeveloped, the so-called new territories. Uh, and so named in 1898 with the lease of that area to the British government at that time from the Qing government of China. 40% um, of the area of Hong Kong is these upland country parks. So these are protected areas in the mountains. Archaeological heritage management in Hong Kong has a geographical focus uh, which is on the lowlands. It's the areas where the development has occurred, where the impacts have happened on the known archaeological resource. And so most of that focus has been on the lowlands, and we know consequently very little about the archaeology of the mountainous regions. The Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, which came in in 1976, is itself something of uh, an historic relic. Um, that took about 20 years circulating in government before it was uh, published. Uh, and it's not been updated since 1976, so it's still very monument, building, and site focused. Uh, rather, uh, unlike the People's Republic of China, which does allow the uh, consideration of groups of buildings, it also uh, allows some consideration of setting and of landscape. So there are some uh, kind of advances that are needed in terms of really starting to think about uh, the heritage in a landscape, uh, from a landscape perspective. The EIA ordinance, which came in in 1998, uh, has an emphasis on landscape very much as scenery or, or as ecology, but not necessarily as history. This is a map of Hong Kong with red dots showing the positions of the 208 archaeological sites so far uh, recorded by the Antiquities and Monuments Office. And what will be very obvious, I think, is that these large areas of mountains around Tai Mo Shan, oh, didn't want to do that, I'm going to tick. Around, around Tai Mo Shan, here, the central islands of Lantau, uh, central mountains of Lantau, sorry, Lantau Island, and these other upland areas, you will see there are hardly any archaeological sites marked in those areas. But we know from the study of remote sensing imagery, satellite images, old aerial photographs, that those areas are completely full of archaeological features, ancient cultivation terraces being prominent amongst them. So only three sites in the uplands, two boulder trackways and one small game board rock carving, but no kind of landscape features on a grander scale of the kind that we know are actually existing up there. So here's some nice pictures of Hong Kong's mountainous uplands. When we think about these kind of areas in tropical East and Southeast Asia, um, Hong Kong and China included, these upland historic landscapes have barely been studied by archaeologists, even though in many cases they are extensively terraced and in use for cultivation, or they at least were in the past. Um, so these areas are very little studied by archaeologists, poorly understood, and therefore potentially at risk. In the Hong Kong, upland areas, the vast majority of these, of these mountainous areas are country parks. Since the 1970s, they were protected under this country park scheme managed by the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department. So many of these areas today are perceived as places of recreation, places of nature, uh, where people go hiking to escape the kind of intense urbanism of the lowland areas. Um, the term Hong Kong's green long has been used in the past to describe them. But they are also, fundamentally, cultural landscapes. They are cultural landscapes. And these areas, in some cases, have been massively transformed by people in the past. Um, and there are many artificial features, especially cultivation terraces, which is our particular interest in this research project. And these are not currently mapped, inventoried, in other words, listed or categorized, or protected as cultural heritage. So let's just uh, take a quick look at some of the, uh, the fieldwork aims, uh, specifically to address the gap in our knowledge that is suggested by this lowland focus in the archaeological work that's been so far done in Hong Kong. So we're missing this understanding of upland land use history. Uh, and we'll be trying to address that by using remote sensing data, things like satellite imagery, old aerial photographs, laser scanning from aircraft, LIDAR, um, and these allow us to identify clusters of upland cultivation terraces 
and plot them and map them using a geographical information system, GIS. Now, being able to identify things remotely, I've been identifying them remotely from Newcastle in the UK, studying Hong Kong. Um, it's one thing to identify something from uh, space or from the air, but we still need to understand what the condition is and what the truth of those monuments is on the ground. In other words, we need to do some form of tr ground truthing survey. And we're doing that at the moment. We just started this week on Wednesday and Thursday. We did site visits to uh, between Taimo San and uh, Chou San, and also on Nailak San, um, walking along the trail and then going down the hillsides and investigating these features that I'd identified using remote sensing data on my computer back in the UK, using the coordinates that I'd got from the geographic information system to navigate into the landscape, quite often with lots of trees and grass and scrub, to actually find out what is really there. And in all those locations, we've identified the terraces that I could see from that remote sensing work. Um, what we're then doing is uh, geoarchaeological sampling. So we, we're taking an area of a terrace which has already collapsed in antiquity, and then excavating a small slot trench into it, and taking a column sample uh, that we can use for dating. And the dating we're using is something called optically stimulated luminescence, profiling, and dating. It's a very long name, so we call it OSLPD for short. Um, and we'll have more details of that from Tim later. And this is quite a new innovative technique designed at the Research Centre in Scotland, where Tim uh, has been involved for many years. About a decade ago, this was devised, and Sam and Tim have been working on projects around that kind of Mediterranean region in particular, applying this methodology to date mountain terraces. So we're hoping it works just as well in Hong Kong as it does in these other places uh, that work has occurred. So that's a brief introduction. What I'd like to do now is to invite uh, Sam up to speak. And Sam will give us a, a, wider, a wider geographical context for the work we're doing in Hong Kong by explaining something about the many projects that he and Tim have been doing over the last few years, uh, developing this technique and a, and a means of investigating these landscapes. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mick. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you this afternoon. Can you hear me? It was working just now. Oh, I have to hold it very close. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Mick. Yes, as, as uh, Mick just said, uh, we have been working to develop uh, this technique for dating Earth features for some years now, principally because for archaeologists, Earth work features, which could be agricultural terraces, or they could be Earth banks, such as we have associated with many ancient settlements, or the Earth banks forming the boundaries of fields, these are very traditionally very difficult or impossible to date scientifically. And that's uh, for a number of reasons, usually because we don't find any cultural material, ceramics or other objects, within those features that we can use to date them. And so Tim Kinnaird and I have been collaborating for some years now to uh, trial the methodology that he will be describing uh, after I finish speaking, to date uh, Earth features of this kind, including uh, terraces in the Mediterranean, principally. And um, a few years ago, uh, we began to speak with Mick, and uh, Mick suggested that perhaps it might be possible to attempt to date some of the features, the upland features in Hong Kong, using the same kind of method, which is how I come to be standing in front of you this afternoon. It's thanks to Mick and his uh, interest in these upland landscapes. 
So uh, this is a, a slide which we use often uh, associated with one of our projects called Terraces as Sustainable Agricultural Environments. Uh, and here we're working uh, in different parts of the Mediterranean to investigate uh, this question of the, the chronology and the uh, historic uses of terraces in that region. And because this is the method that we are applying here, we thought it might be interesting for you to see how we've been using it so far and to see what kinds of results we have had. So uh, this project, this particular project, is a collaboration between uh, ourselves and Tim Kennedy in St. Andrews and the University of Granada in southern Spain. <coughs> the purpose of this project then, as I said before, is to understand the creation the use and the role of agricultural terraces within the historic landscape of these regions. And uh, so we have been making a detailed investigation then of past strategies of land use in specific locations in order to try to understand how these landscapes developed over the long term. And this is... Uh, a typical landscape on the island of Naxos in Greece. Naxos is in the southern uh, Aegean Sea in the eastern Mediterranean. And it has a heavily terraced landscape. We estimate, we haven't calculated exactly, that on this island, which is around 40 kilometers long and 30 kilometers wide, there are something like 30,000 kilometers of terraces, so very many terraces. And the great problem for archaeologists is that nobody had any idea how old these features were. Typically, when asked about the age of such features, archaeologists tend to become a little defensive and say, mm, we think they're from the 19th century. Because Effectively, they don't want to be wrong about estimating an earlier days. I'll return to Naxos in a moment, but this is just a, uh, a map that gives you an idea of the case studies that we have been working on as part of this project. You can see that they uh, go from northwest Spain in the west uh, right across to the southern coast of Turkey, so across the whole northern shore of the Mediterranean. And um, we now have a, a significant data set of dated earthwork features from this whole region, over 300 uh, dated locations. But I can introduce our, our project, our method, through the case study of Naxos. So this is where Naxos is in the southern Aegean Sea. And this is what the landscape looks like you can see that there are these agricultural terraces. They often have trees growing on them. These are mostly olive trees. In the Mediterranean, it's common to have a practice of polyculture, where we have more than one crop growing on the terrace at the same time. So we might have trees like olives, almonds, fruit trees, also being cultivated at the same time as cereal crops or other vegetables. Well, this is a, 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 a map, a landscape analysis of a part of the island of Naxos. And on this diagram, the terraces are represented by the green lines. And the red lines represent dry stone walls. And if you look at the diagram, you can see that there is a relationship between the terraces and the stone walls, which is that the terraces are always underneath, underlying the stone walls. So we know that the stone walls are later, therefore, than the terraces. But we still don't know. Uh, this gives us a relative chronology, but not an absolute chronology. We think that the dry stone walls here are mostly constructed in the 18th and the 19th century as part of a process of land reform. The terraces then are older, but we don't know how much older. Now, we do have some clues. 
This uh, building uh, called Agios Isidoros, which is Saint Isidore, is a church. It was built in the late 6th or the early 7th century of the Common Era. And Naxos is a sort of paradise for early medieval archaeologists because it has hundreds of small standing early medieval buildings of this sort all across the landscape of the island. You can see that uh, on the diagram here we have a number of early Byzantine and middle Byzantine churches. Those all belong to the period between around 500 and around 1100. So they're very early, you know, and amazing that they survive. They're mostly rather simple buildings like this, some with decoration on the inside. But one of the things that we noticed when we started working on the island of Naxos is that there sometimes is a relationship between the church buildings and the terraces. And you can see, perhaps, in this case, that the church of Agiotisidoros appears to stand on one of those terraces. And some of these terraces are extremely long, running for over a kilometer along this hillside. And in fact, this church also, which is also dating around 600, is also apparently standing on a terrace. Well, if this observation is correct, then the terrace must be older than the church. But we had no way to test this until we started to collaborate with uh, Tim Kinnaird. <coughs> now, we've done quite a lot of archaeological work here on the island of Naxos. This is a uh, mountaintop fortress that belongs to the Byzantine period. And here are the ruins of a mountainside village. Everything you see here was constructed between the 7th and the 10th century of the Common Era. Now completely ruined, but you can walk up and find uh, many buildings on the top of the mountainside here. And to uh, test, uh, to, to develop our knowledge of this landscape, we've undertaken various types of archaeological work, including field survey. You can see here we've got uh, the distribution of uh, ceramic shards, pottery shards, from across this landscape to try and map out the distribution of settlements. So this is helpful in that it helps us to understand the pattern of settlement in the past. Uh, these are mostly uh, ceramics dating from the Roman and um, early medieval period, so the first millennium of the Common Era. But of course, knowing that people lived here is not the same as knowing what they were doing or how they were cultivating this land. And you can see here what some of these terraces look like in this region. They're quite uh, damaged. They're being quite eroded by animals, and uh, uh, some of them are in a, a fairly poor condition. So in order to test this as part of this, this project on uh, 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 sustainable agricultural environments, we have been using the technique, the OSLPD technique, to excavate small sampling trenches and collect samples for geoarchaeological analysis using the luminescence method. Uh, this is uh, an example of one of our study sites. You can see these are abandoned terraces on this mountainside. This is what they look like in the field. So this is uh, trench one here. And here is Tim and our colleague Ayush Srivastava uh, processing the samples in the field. And these are the uh, results for the dating of the construction of those terraces, those three examples in this part of the valley. And you can see that what we have found is that we have terraces here which are constructed from the 4th century BCE through into the 6th century CE. So of course those features are still there, so they've continued to exist since they were constructed. 
So we can estimate from this that this whole system is dating from the Hellenistic to the early Byzantine period, a period of around uh, 800 to 1,000 years. This, cons this system was constructed on this mountainside. Where we tested this, these conclusions in a number of different areas, a number of parts of the island. This is a little bit further down the same valley with a slightly different type of terraces. These ones are rather narrower and uh, better conserved, actually, but in the same valley. And here we have had uh, rather similar interesting results, although here we can show the development of terraces. So this is one terrace which was built during the Roman period in the second century CE, and it had added to it in the 16th century a small pocket terrace for planting an olive tree. So we can see that we have development of the system using this technique. A final example from another part of the island, just some more uh, agricultural terraces. You can see this is what the landscape typically looks like. And here, once again, we have um, terraces dating from the early and middle Byzantine periods. So what we've discovered is that when we stand on a mountainside, on an island in the southern Aegean, and we look out across the view, more or less what we see is what we would have seen if we had been standing there 1,200 years ago. Those features had already been constructed and were already being used. Now, of course, the landscape has changed a little. There are probably more trees in it today. And the stone walls, which you can see an example of here, did not exist yet because those were built uh, rather later. But effectively, the structure of that landscape had already been created. And we know this now because we are able to date these features. So this is the first step of our research, making the dating. But we can also use this knowledge to help inform other types of analyses. So this is another example of a project called uh, Historic Landscape and Soil Sustainability, also funded by the European Commission. And this was a postdoctoral project with our colleague, uh, Dr. Filippo Brandolini, who is about to leave Newcastle University for a new job at MIT in Boston. And uh, here we were working in northern Italy in the Apennine Mountains. Uh, again, with systems of historic terraces. You can see one here, which has partly collapsed, where this tree has caused the uh, stonework to fail in the front of the terrace. Now, one of the objectives of Filippo's project was to uh, date the construction of these terraces. So with Tim's uh, work, we were able to understand that this terrace system was built a little bit later than the ones in the east of Mediterranean, but in the uh, 11th to 13th centuries of the Common Era. You can see these huge blocks which are used to face the terraces here. This is a landscape which also has uh, records from documentary evidence of other types of exploitation, for example, agroforestry. Here, this is for a uh, mixed cultivation of vines which grew up these trees and between the trees and cereals underneath. This is a landscape which has changed a lot in the last 100 years with the mechanization of agriculture on the one hand, but also the afforestation of the mountains. There have been many trees have been growing uh, through natural processes in these mountains. And so in this project, we've been seeking to investigate the environmental consequences of historic landscape change over the last 70 years, and to see if we can understand whether this landscape is what we might call a sustainable landscape. 
So some techniques that we've been using to help us understand this are computer modeling methods to uh, understand how the landscape has changed uh, in the face of modern agriculture. So here you can see terrain models, which model the surface of the land in the present time, 2020, and uh, in 1978, so uh, nearly 50 years ago. And by comparing these uh, two models, we can understand the extent of landscape change. So for example, this shows us the difference between the modern land surface in blue and the historic land surface in red. You can see that it used to have a terraced landscape represented here. But today, those terraces have been destroyed by agriculture, modern agriculture. We can use that to calculate the amount of soil that's been lost from this uh, mountainside. So we want to make our uh, research on the historic features also relevant for understanding the current landscape and for managing the future landscape. And so to do that, we're using uh, computing techniques, modeling techniques. I'm not going into the details of this. But what that enables us to do is to visualize the extent of soil erosion at different times and to help understand how different soil management, landscape management regimes have affected the way the landscape has changed in the past and to help us try to understand how it might change in the future. And indeed, uh, this has pointed to the fact that the historic terraces provide a very important role, an important service in retaining soil and preventing flooding in, uh, in this landscape. And as we face a changing climate with increasingly severe risk of flooding, flood water and extreme weather, these are functions of these historic features which make them perhaps important. So this is uh, uh, another map from uh, the same project and here we've been looking at uh, soil erosion and movement under different uh, landscape management regimes. Here, imagining if we planted back all those historic trees which used to exist in this landscape. Well, <coughs> we started this work in the Mediterranean, but we uh, are keen to explore whether the same techniques can be used in uh, other parts of the world also. And so over the course of the last year, we have been undertaking case studies in other parts of the world. In uh, northern Sudan in November last year, in the valley of the River Nile. In March of this year, in uh, Oman, you see us here inspecting some of these fantastic irrigated terrace systems in this very dry part of uh, Eastern Arabia. And last week and next week, <laughs> here in Hong Kong, where we uh, are intending and hoping to be able to use this methodology to understand the development of the terrace systems and uh, their role in the historic landscape. OK, I think that's the end of me. And I, <laughs> I hand over back to Mick. Thank you, Sam. Cheers. Thanks very much, Sam. So that gives us a wider understanding of the context of this kind of research that we're doing in Hong Kong. Um, so the, the Catacol project, yeah, we're in Hong Kong for just under two weeks. Uh, working with our colleagues in the Antiquities and Monuments Office, a number of who I see today, sitting, watching, and listening, doing upland field investigations in order to, under, uh, to enhance our understanding of historic upland land use in Hong Kong, an area of archaeology in this region which has really not been studied previously. Um, lowland characterization is another thing that my project will also be doing. I won't go into a great deal of detail about that today, but I'm also characterizing lowland historic lands, uh, land use and verifying uh, the mapping of historic landscape features, field systems, ancient villages, um, which are already mapped 
they still appear on the modern historic maps in many cases, but I can, con I can compare and contrast those mapped images with what I can see in the remote sensing data and verify um, what has been mapped and maybe augment it if necessary. So these are the landscapes um, that used to characterize the lowlands of Hong Kong, which Pat will remember when he first came to Hong Kong in the 70s. There were still some of these landscapes operating, uh, still being farmed by these rice farming communities. So rice farming was, at one time, it stretched for miles and miles and miles across the lowland landscapes of Hong Kong, typically with these small earth bonds dividing up the paddy fields with carefully designed irrigation systems, leets and channels and sluice gates, managing the ability to let water into the fields, drain water away, and at various times of the year, the harvest coming in onto the wartong, the, the rice drying ground in front of the village. Lowland terraces, of course, were an important part of those uh, landscapes. So we have the terraced fields on the lower hill slopes. The terraces we're talking about in terms of our present research are much higher up in the mountains and were not claimed uh, by the rice farmers when the survey of the new territories was conducted in 1899 to 1904. Those, those upland landscapes were out of sight and out of mind for those rice farming villagers um, and not claimed by them as part of their land holding. These lowland villages and field systems, um, however, are still not really uh, recorded and inventoried as historic landscape. They're still mapped because of cadastral reasons somebody owns them. Um, but they're not actually considered in terms of historic landscape for management purposes, in terms of cultural heritage. So the AHM development in, in the AHM in Hong Kong, the archaeological heritage management, is very much development driven. Archaeologists look where there is going to be a development impact, whether that's housing scheme, a road development, whatever it might be. So the study of archaeologists has in many cases been led by uh, the locations of those impacts on the historic landscape, which has tended to be mostly in the lowland areas where most of the intensive development continues to occur. So those kind of impact assessments would consider any previous findings, any previous archaeological uh, discoveries in those areas, the village histories, but it's not kind of an historic, his holistic landscape study. It is very much focused on a specific areas being impacted and not thinking about the wider connections in the landscape. So that lack of an historic landscape character baseline um, limits our understanding of past landscape change, which is something that Sam has just been talking about in terms of managing change in the landscape. You have to understand something better about the baseline of how that landscape was used in the past, how it has changed until today, and how through a range of in impacts and uh, factors affecting it, how it might change in the future, and how we can, we can try to more sustainably manage these landscapes. Now we have a range of resources which I'm using in terms of remote sensing, uh, such as the 1905 uh, cadastral maps, which were the result of that uh, land survey conducted by the Survey of India in 1899-1904, which produced this range of beautiful um, not topographic maps, there are no spot heights, there are no contours, but every field and every building at that time, including watercourses and trackways, were recorded on these maps, so they're a useful thing. I can geo-reference those and put them in the GIS, and they can be very useful. We also have such uh, things such as these wonderful high-resolution vertical aerial photographs from 1963, which were taken uh, for the production of the first large-scale detailed maps of the new territories. And they, they're an extremely useful resource in looking at these upland landscapes that I'm studying. Now the landscape today, this is Hao Hang, which is a, an area very familiar to Pat, who wrote a paper about this in about 1992, uh, talking about a landscape shaped by Feng Soi, which he co-authored with, with a local resident, uh, a scholar, and teacher called Lei Man Yip, uh, which is one of the first things I read when I came to Hong Kong and got interested in landscape, was Pat's paper about this particular landscape. This is what it looks like today. A lot of development of trees on the lower hill slopes, but the valley has still got 
uh, the field systems are still visible even though they're now completely overgrown. And they're still mapped on the modern maps because somebody owns each of those fields and they're still recorded for cadastral reasons. But they're now in many cases overgrown. But if we look at the LIDAR data, we can still see through these forested lower hill slopes and we can see that those terraces are still there and they're still in wonderful condition. So they still survive very well. So this is a range of uh, remote sensing resources which I can use. In the lowland areas, what we're also doing is called historic landscape characterization. So we're, we're identifying specific areas of, oops, sorry, we're identifying specific areas of the landscape with different landscape character, different histories of land use. And those areas are then uh, delineated with a polygon and they're given a different uh, label and that carries different meanings in terms of how that landscape has been used in the past and how it's kind of uh, moved forward into the present era. An interesting thing to note, for example, is the survival of what I would call ancient woodland, in this case, Fong Soi woodland. If you look at the 1963 aerial photograph when these hillsides are quite bare, you will see that this woodland is still intact. It survived World War II and it survived into the modern era because people, even during the Japanese occupation, these kind of woodlands were respected and protected by the people. And I suspect were probably the Japanese uh, soldiers in the area were probably quite wary of, of cutting down Feng Shui woodlands because it, it would cause a significant uh, disturbance with the local community. So they survived in many cases, even through World War II. So I'm identifying these different historic character types, uh, which reflect the different cultural activities and perceptions behind these landscapes, why they were created and why they may have survived into the modern era, things such as feng soy, but also rice farming, and then into the modern era, changes in attitudes to land custodianship and management, even ideas of sense of place and how that's changed into the modern era in some places. So if you go into some parts of the new territories that used to be rice farming, you will see a far less well-preserved landscape. You will see filled fields, open container storage, widespread development of village houses, but that has not yet happened in this valley. And part of that is, I think, a continuing sense of place and a value of the feng soi and of the natural environment that sustained this valley and this community for many, many centuries. So the database that I'm creating is of this historic landscape character, and that's used to record landscape change in different epochs. So each of these polygons, these shapes, may have undergone different uses at different times in its history. So I will then have for that individual shape, possibly multiple epochs talking about how the landscape has changed through time. So by using HLC, we can then assess uh, the impact of past and future development on the survival, integrity, and legibility of historic elements, starting to think about ideas such as resilience, how well a particular landscape type can cope with change and, and when change becomes something which actually means it is no longer sustainable and the change might be irreversible. So this holistic view allows us to better manage the historic landscape in terms of sustainability which is something that Sam has already been uh, talking about. So that's the lowlands which I just wanted to briefly introduce that we are actually looking at, my research is actually looking at that as well as the upland landscapes. In the, up, the uplands, we have a number of different types of land use to consider. And by uplands here, I'm talking notionally about the land above the 300 meter contour. But that's just a notional figure. Uh, many of the upland terraces we're looking at, such as these on Taimo San around Route Twisk, are uh, at 600 meters or higher in many cases, high up on the mountains. We also have things such as this, which is uh, wolframite tungsten mining from the 1950s on uh, Lin Fa San, and you can see the individual adits, and you can see these spreads of spoil. This landscape is now forested, but if you look at the LIDAR data, those uh, spreads of debris are very clear in the LIDAR data. They still show up very well. Here we have World War II evidence uh, above Ngao Tam Mei, and this is a defensive installation on a hill, hilltop, which we uh, here, which is thought to be a multi-layer uh, barbed wire emplacement, and then a series of uh, trenches. This would be very much of interest to our uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Wallace Lai of PolyU, who currently has a project uh, mapping and recording World War II landscapes using some of the similar remote sensing data that we're using. 
But this is what we're really mostly interested in at the moment, is these upland terrace landscapes. So here's an image of an area that some of you uh, were walking with us the other day on Taimo San. So we walked, oops, sorry, excuse me. We walked from, uh, let's think, somewhere over here, and we walked down this landscape, looked at these terraces. We looked at some of these over here. This is T Taimo Shan 1, Taimo Shan Site 2, Taimo Shan Site 3 in our project. This is how the landscape looked in 2015, relatively clear, but quite a few trees there. And then just seven years later, there's a significant increase in the scale of the, the trees that were there already, but there's also been some significant tree planting going on by Kadori Farm. So Kadori Farm has an active tree planting program, which we saw the other day on the mountaintop. It's fenced off, and you can see that the trees are protected from grazing animals such as wild boar, and in particular deer, which love to eat saplings of trees. Um, so they're trying to uh, reforest that landscape. And this is our Taimo Shan Site 3 area here, where we'll be taking a look, I think, on Tuesday this week. Now, even though that landscape is reforesting, we have access to the LIDAR data. This is laser, airborne laser scanning using laser scanners from aircraft, and that can see through the canopy to reveal these terraced landscapes underneath. So you can see some beautiful resolution of some of these mountain terraces showing up through uh, the trees using that uh, laser scanning technique. So this can be very useful. And this has been processed by something called uh, the Re Relief Visualization Toolbox, which is a free piece of software developed by the Slovenian Academy of Sciences. So very clever people. Uh, and I'm using that uh, in my research to help process the LiDAR data. And this is what the landscape looked like. This more or less is the same area in 1963. We have these wonderful high-resolution uh, aerial photographs taken primarily for mapping purposes to create uh, large-scale maps. Uh, and the specification for that aerial photo survey was that it was only supposed to be recording up to the 600-foot contour but thankfully, from our point of view, they actually overflow, overflew some of the highest mountains as well and recorded these incredible terraced landscapes. So this is, uh, you can see the scale there. This is just a 100 meter scale here. So this is probably about five or 600 meters wide by about 500 meters tall. If we zoom in on this particular area here, you can see some interesting interaction between different elements in this historic landscape. Yeah, just there. So we have these things. So we have two historic clan graves, one here and one here. Several things of interest to note about these is that they are co-aligned, which is what you will find all over the hills of Hong Kong. You will find clusters of graves with a shared alignment. That's almost certainly due to Feng Shui considerations. Uh, which one was first? Not really sure. Possibly this one, and then that one was co-aligned with it. And what we can also see is that the, the earth mound for these graves is overlapping the edge of some of these terraces. So it looks like these graves have probably been placed on top of the terraced landscape. By how many years, we don't know. If we could access these graves, it may be that they have surviving inscriptions, which we can read, and that might give us a date when they were actually uh, done there. What we can also see is that there are potentially different phases of activity in terms of terracing as well. Many of these terrace uh, blocks seem to have interference patterns around their edges where it looks like one block may be of a different period to another. Quite difficult to untangle just from the aerial images, but there, do, there does appear to be some stratigraphy, horizontal stratigraphy in these landscapes that the terraces are not all of the same period. How much apart in date they are, we don't know. So we want to know really uh, how many phases of development there are, how long it took for this landscape to develop into this form, when were they made, how long were they in use, and if possible, when were they abandoned as well. And this is where this technique of optically stimulated luminescence, profiling and dating, OSLPD, which has been widely used in all those areas that Sam discussed earlier, uh, seems to offer a good solution for us and a means of answering some of those questions. So there are those graves. 
highlighted there with the arrows. So optically stimulated luminescence profiling and dating, OSLPD. This is a field sampling method, and this is a, a slot trench from uh, the fieldwork in Granada, which I joined in February 2022, using the portable OSL meter, which is here, attached to a, a computer, a laptop. And that allows us to, uh, when we've cut the slot, to take a column sample, which you can see here. And then we can put those samples through the meter, which Tim will go through in a great deal more detail, identify points of interest, and then do some dating, which can then lead, hopefully, to an understanding of the date and life sequence of each of these terrace monuments. I'll hand over now to Dr. Tim Kinnaird, who can tell us a bit more about this technique and, and what it can do for us as archaeologists in our collaborations with earth scientists such as Tim. Thank you very much. So, Sam and Mick have asked the question, how do we date these terraced walls and earthworks? So the solution is uh, luminescence dating. And how does luminescence dating work? Well, our environment is really active, yeah, so there's a dose rate. If you can quantify that dose rate, and then quantify the amount of energy that deposits in certain minerals, we have an age equation. What we can do in the field is we can characterize the luminescence of the sediment. So we have this uh, little black box here. Oh. Oh, one. Yeah. This little black box here. And on the bottom axis, we have time. Vertical axis, we have luminescence or light intensity. I take several measurements. I do a background. Then I look at the infrared stimulated luminescence, the background, then the blue light stimulated luminescence. So these signals come from different minerals. What we can then do is we can take multiple measurements through the sequence and we can compare our younger strata to our older strata. And hopefully you can see in this graph here that the young sediment, it comes back with a low count so a low luminescence intensity, where our older sediment comes back with a higher intensity. So the luminescence dating system is reset by daylight. Yep. So the low intensities means that that sediment was exposed to daylight recently. It's not had long to acquire a radiation dose. The older sediment, it's been buried for longer. It's been receiving a radiation dose for longer and more luminescence grows in situ. So we have these relative signals of luminescence intensities that we can compare in a sedimentary profile. So just to talk you through this and put that in context, this is the uh, site of Ginnerup in Denmark. It's a Neolithic site. So these sediments in the center here date from 3,000 years BCE. And what we do is you can see each of my sampling spots coming through there. We take a sample, and hopefully it moves on. The first thing we do is we contrast our young sediment to our old sediment. And we're looking for the trend with depth. So the way to interpret these graphs, and we're going to see some from Hong Kong later, is we look at the intensities. So anything with a low density intensity is young. Anything with a high intensity is old. So we can start to build up a chronology for the sediment and look at how the intensities change within that. So uh, this is our Neolithic midden coming through here. So I have a relative age. I can show that the sediment above is all one package and the sediment below is of is older in age. Uh, but more importantly, we can start to look at the progressions and the breaks through this sequence. And they start to tell us where their temporal breaks are uh, and the, the rates of sedimentation. Um, 
So just to summarise this, this is some work I've been doing in the Stonehenge landscape in uh, England. Uh, the luminescence age equation is that the burial dose, so that's the luminescence that's grown in situ after deposition, divided by the environmental dose rate. Uh, and just to clarify that, uh, the dose rate is the radioactivity of the soil. And that's because all soil and sediment contains small concentrations of potassium, uranium, and thorium, and they decay, giving a dose rate. Oh, don't know what's happened there. Uh, the burial dose is the energy that's been absorbed by the minerals in response to that dose rate. So that was a very quick background to luminescence, uh, and now we're going to put it in the context of Hong Kong. So uh, back to Mick. Okay, this is uh, an image of, uh, this is a contrast of uh, Hong Kong, one of those kind of massively transformed landscapes. This, of course, is Chap Lap Kok Airport. Um, the tiny remnant of that island is more or less just down here. There's a tiny corner left just on one part of the airport, but the vast majority uh, was flattened and spread out to create Hong Kong Airport. Here, we're walking along the uh, Nong Ping Rescue Trail, which goes underneath the cable car, high up on the mountainside on this uh, rather exciting hiking trail. Um, this was part of our work the other day on Thursday, I think, when we hiked up to Nailak San to do some ground truthing up there with the AMO fieldwork team, trying to uh, investigate and understand some of the features that I could see from the remote sensing data by going on the ground and actually investigating those locations, navigating to those coordinates that I'd identified and seeing what was actually there. This is uh, the day after or the day before, I forget. The day before, I think, yeah. The day before we, we were dropped off at the top of Taimoshan and we hiked from Taimoshan along the ridge to the east to Tosan, Grassy Hill. And the nice thing about this trail, the Maklahos Trail, is that at one point, just below the peak of Taimoshan, you actually walk through the middle of a series of eroded agricultural terraces. The Maklahos Trail goes right through the middle of them. And that's what we're crossing through here, east of Taimoshan. That uh, work we were doing involved us hiking all the way to Grassy Hill, and this is getting towards the Grassy Hill end of that uh, trek. In between, we were going down the hillsides investigating uh, terrace features that I'd identified previously in the remote sensing data. This is on the Maclehose Trail, just west of Leadmine Pass, heading towards Grassy Hill to inspect some terraces in that location. Back to the uh, Nailak San ground truthing uh, survey. One of the features that I identified in that area was this rather intriguing linear feature, kind of curving and then going straight down the hillside. This is a hillside, I think, at about 700 meters PD above sea level, more or less. And here's this linear feature running across the line of the rescue trail. This is the Nailak San uh, trail going through here. And at that point of intersection, we checked this coordinate. And what we found was this really quite nice uh, dry stone wall feature running up the hillside, presumably some form of boundary feature on the hillside. Why they felt the need to, to make a boundary there is an intriguing question, but quite nearby are a series of terraces. There's one here, and there are many more terraces further along the trail in this direction going to the southwest. So there's that feature in the landscape and in the remote sensing data. So this is why we do the ground truthing survey to confirm what I've seen in the remote sensing data by actually walking into the landscape and checking these features. This is some work that we've just done on Friday, the first site where we've been actually sampling. This is on uh, Grassy Hill, Chosan, uh, site one, Grassy Hill site one, and this is terrace number GRH for Grassy Hill. Uh, 1.3. So we sampled three terraces, one, two, and three, working down the slope. Um, 
And this is a good candidate for our sampling because, it, as you can see here, it's partially collapsed. The upper part of the terrace in this location has collapsed. So we can then just cut away that collapsed portion and then dig into the uh, terrace a short distance, create a vertical section, which is then suitable for sampling for OSLPD. And you can also see in here that this is one of a series of many terraces on this hillside. There's a second one here, a third one here, and then further ones going up the slope. And all these terraces are sloping diagonally across the hillside. They're not contour terraces horizontally bedded. They're all sloping across the hillside, presumably to allow free draining uh, through there, which is one feature that might suit tea, but it might also suit other uh, plants as well. Once we've selected a location for sampling, we then excavate a small slot trench into the terrace. And this is Sam digging one of those uh, in this picture. And then once we've cut that uh, slot trench, we then put a black, a blackout sheet across the top of that small sampling trench put rocks and spades and other weighted instruments around it to keep the light out. So it's completely black under the sheet. And then using a red light head torch, Tim goes in there and takes a series of samples in a column down through that vertical face and collects them in, a small, in small petri dishes, which he's holding one here. You can't see it so well, but that's what he's doing, using a trowel to take a sample from that uh, face of that uh, terrace that we're sampling in this picture. As well as doing that kind of sampling for the OSLPD scientific dating, we're also, of course, doing the kind of more traditional archaeological recording of uh, drawing the sections and profiles and also photographing uh, before we excavate the terraces, the excavated terraces, and also taking record photographs of the reinstated terrace after we've finished and backfilled uh, each one. So this is a more traditional kind of uh, regular piece of archaeological work which you would do on any archaeological site. Here I think in the bottom left this is uh, taking bulk samples from that vertical section which can be analyzed in a different way, not, 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 not specifically for dating, Tim. Yeah, that's for other purposes, the bulk sampling. We can talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> And in the background, a rare image of Sam Turner sitting, chatting on an archaeological site is usually perpetual motion, digging, sampling, uh, and a very active guy on the field. So he's quite an unusual. I quite like this picture to actually catch him stationary for once on an archaeological site. Um, here we can see the uh, OSL reader being used. And these are the small dishes which would contain the sediment sampled in, the, in that column down the section taking the readings which are displayed on the computer screen next to the instrument and then writing down the records as uh, the results come out. And this is uh, all done using the samples collected using the red light under the blackout sheet. The blackout sheet, of course, is used because if light gets on those sampling faces, it will bleach all the luminescence signal out and you won't have anything for dating purposes. So it has to be black, completely black, and use red light. Now, this is something that is far beyond my capabilities to interpret. And I think I should really hand the microphone back to Tim Kinnaird, who is a man who can explain what this all means. Thank you, Tim. Right. I know you all want to know the age of these terraces. That's not something I can tell you today. To do that, we need to take the samples back to the lab. And then Mick has to do a lot of fancy mineral preparation and other techniques to get those dates. But what we need to do is we need to tie the chronology for the sediments to the terrace wall. It's all good saying we can date the sediment behind the terrace, but how do you relate that age of that terrace to construction of the terrace wall? Uh, so we opened three little test pits on Friday. Uh, so this is just a sequence down the hill for terraces one, two, and three. Uh, and that's what you can see in these pictures. And then under that dark cover that you saw on the screen a second ago, 
I took multiple samples through it. And that's what each of these rows corresponds to. And then for each sample, we have a luminescence value. Yep. So this is just to summarize that and uh, provide some first insights on chronology. So what I'm plotting here is depth in the sediment column and light intensity. So you'll remember from my earlier slides, that's our proxy for age. And then because we want to relate the sediments behind the terrace wall to construction, whenever there was a chance to, I would put a couple of samples in to the side beneath the terrace wall. So on, the, on these plots then, the blue are the values from behind the terrace wall, and the gray is from under the terrace wall. Yep. And then we can look at how that luminescence varies. So you can see straight away that they all show a progression to higher values with depth, which is what you'd expect. Expect. That's just your normal age depth progression. But then we can see at which point in the, the sediment column behind the terrace wall that we can equate the sediment that was potentially bleached beneath the wall. Yep. So that's important. It means we know where to put our dating samples in. And we can say with certainty that the sample is dating construction. Um, yeah, so that's the justification for uh, taking these profiles. But what's interesting already is from these three test pits, we can look at the range and values. Uh, and all I'm doing here is color coding each cell by its intensity. So the blues, that's your low intensities. So it was bleached fairly recently. And your reds, that's your high intensity. So it's been buried for longer. Why is that out of a depth trend? Well, that's because there is a, con a constructional phase that passed through the back of that where sediment was redeposited rapidly and the sediment wasn't exposed to daylight. Yeah? But that's another justification for putting the dating sample beneath that because then we have TPQ for construction in that, in that uh, profile. But if we just look at these range in intensities, you can see that the the terrace wall, lowest on that slope, returns lower values. So I know that there's going to be a chronology through these uh, terrace walls. Walls one and two are going to be comparable in age, whereas three will be more recent. So this is just day one. We're going to go back to Grassy Hill on uh, Monday, tomorrow. We're going to uh, sample another section of terraces, and we'll be able to start to build this chronology for terrace construction across the, those slopes. And then we're going to move to other areas in the, the hill. And then we'll have a chronological sequence to terracing. Um, yep, I think that's that for now. What have we got here? So as Tim said, that's just some initial findings, but we can already see that we seem to have some kind of chronology down the slope with the ones higher up being older and the one at the bottom being younger. Uh, but until we put that through the, uh, the processing in the lab, we don't have a calendar date yet. We just have a relative, relative sequence. Um, so this is Grassy Hill Site 1 still. So after that uh, column of samples has been taken under the sheet using the red light uh, and that initial set of readings is gathered, we can then make a decision about the best place to do a driven tubular dating sample. So this is a metal tube that's hammered into the section at the best sampling location identified by those readings we get from the portable OSL reader. So this is the whole idea of it being OSLPD, the profiling and dating. It's these decisions where, that it allows us to make on site to take our samples in the best possible location. So. Those samples will eventually, as, as Tim says, I will be heading up to St. Andrews at some point uh, to process those dating samples, and hopefully we'll get some interesting calendar dates to follow. And this is just a close-up of that sample, which has been sealed with black tape 
And then when that's extracted from the section, the other end of that will be sealed up so that sediment sample is completely light proof and intact, ready to be processed back in the lab. And there it is, highlighted. So in conclusion then, um, the Catacol project uh, is mapping and characterizing the historic landscape of Hong Kong. And this is providing the possibility of uh, more sustainable management of future landscape change. That's one of the broad things we're looking to do through the project. Via the OSLPD, the fieldwork that we're presently doing in Hong Kong, and we'll continue tomorrow, uh, this research offers a first opportunity to establish archaeologically a chronology for upland terraced landscape, uh, land use in Hong Kong. That then provides us with a more balanced understanding of Hong Kong's upland landscapes as places not only of nature, of greenery uh, and of recreation, but also of intensive cultural activity in the past. These were busy landscapes in the past. Judging by the terracing that we've seen so far, these, are, uh, these involve a significant investment of human labor. By mapping the upland historic landscapes and validating those lowland records which are mapped in the present mapping, the project is providing a more holistic basis for uh, the future conservation and management of Hong Kong's uh, cultural heritage. I just wanted to say at this point that we are, as a team, really incredibly grateful for the support we've had. We've had uh, the Commissioner for, Her for Heritage behind the project, Ivan Ho Chang, uh, and of course our uh, research collaborators and team members from the AMO who have been helping us uh, make this uh, project, uh, this fieldwork project, a reality. So we're very grateful for, for all their support, uh, and we hope in the next week that we can uh, have another successful week. Looks like we've got good weather, which is great. Uh, and we hope to get some more interesting results uh, in, the, in the remaining days of the project. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we'd be glad to uh, have your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful sharing of Professor Sam Turner, Dr. Tim Kinari, and Dr. Mike Arthur. And we are now entered the, the Q&A session. Any, if you have, please raise your hand and our college will pass the mic to you. Meanwhile, soon audience are welcome to <laughs> submit your question via the Q&A panel. Okay. Uh, Sam. Uh, yeah. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there were no Chinese, Han Chinese settlements within reach of Grassy Hill earlier than the absolute earliest, the late 16th century. Within close proximity of Grassy Hill, not before the 18th century. These Upland terraces have been known for a hundred years, and nobody has been able to have the slightest guess of who, uh, uh, anything about them, because they look older than the people around them. You know, if the, if the, if the villages within reach have a history of 200 years, or absolute maximum 400 years, and these are older than that, and they almost certainly are, I think, then who the hell built them? Yeah, it's a very good question, Pat. Um, at the moment, we just have those relative intensities. I mean, we can't, from the numbers and the, and the environmental dose rate, as far as I know, Tim, we can't make any kind of estimate as to age at this point until we put them through the processing in the lab. Correct. So at the moment, it, all we have is a relative sequence on that hillside. Um, and until we put them through the lab, we cannot uh, speculate, really. Yeah. But who built them if, if they're not of that date? Mm. The, the, the historical sequence is very short. Yeah. I mean, one of the possibilities is, is that there are historical 
records, as you know, from even back to the Song Ming period of... Not in that area, okay. But the re referring to indigenous people. Uh, who, yeah, Lantau, Lantau, specifically. Yeah, but that, that is pure speculation at this point. Yeah. So I think we need... Yeah. So we'll see what, what kind of dates we get back, Pat, and I'll be, I'll be in touch and we can discuss further. <laughs> but at the moment, we're, we're still waiting to do that uh, analysis in the lab and get those dates. But thank you for your question. Hey, Mick, nice to meet you. And, and thank you so much for the, for the talk. Um, sorry, um, I... Sorry, I'm missing the middle part, but I have a question uh, like regarding the OSL dating. Um, uh, uh, well, we know uh, this method uh, might have some limitation with regard to uh, the resolution of the, of the range of the time and the contexts. Uh, so I have two specific questions. First, um, uh, like, like what, what kind of tips uh, uh, you and uh, other team members uh, could give us uh, regarding this method, right? Because uh, it seems that you get, a, like in other projects, uh, this method has been uh, employed in a very productive way. Mm. And the results seems to be quite promising. Um, at, at least we, we don't see that the random dating result, right? And everything seems to be like in sequence. So uh, I, I guess in terms of the methodology, uh, there, there are a lot of lessons we can learn, so uh, that's the first part of the question. The second part is, uh, like, do you have any like preliminary result regarding the, the dating uh, in this project in Hong Kong? Uh, uh, because I missed the middle part, so I, I'm just oh. curious about the, like, the resolution uh, of the samples uh, uh, in this like background. Thank you so much. Well, so it's all about. Uh, providing the context to the dating sample. So the advantage of the uh, method that we employ is we have these uh, um, relative luminescence profiles that allow us to say with certainty that we are dating at the horizon that we want. And then we can tie that into either the archaeological question or the geomorphological question. Uh, you're also referring to resolution, so I guess uh, that's a question on the error estimate. Uh, so with luminescence dating, there's error involved in the uh, lab equipment. So that's calibration error, and we can quantify that, uh, which is generally very low. The larger error comes from how well reset your quartz or your feldspar is at deposition. Yeah. Uh, again, um, we have different techniques to look at that. We can look at equivalent dose distributions, and they let us say if we think the sediment's well bleached or not. But then again, with the method that we have, we refer back to our profiles. Do they have any evidence that the sediment had been reworked? So with the example that we showed on Grassy Hill, if you put a dating sample where the, the spike was, which was constructional, you would overestimate the age of that terrace by hundreds to thousands of years. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the date would be reported with a similar error to the rest of them, but we can show that it's out of context. Yeah. So, we can... Sorry, and in terms of a calendar date, you can't get that until we process a sample with dating samples back at the lab in Scotland. So how long? How long to do that? When, are we, when am I coming to Scotland? Possibly before Christmas, possibly January, possibly January. But s w once we're back in the UK, we'll uh, we'll arrange. We, we'll compare our, cal our our diaries when we get back to the UK and see see what looks feasible. And then on oh, then it was three months before the date comes out after that. <laughs> okay, so possibly about th three or four months before we, we we get those calendar dates. But the the, the important thing that Tim hi highlighted was that we have evidence for a chronology already in that sequence of three terraces that we've sampled. The, the upper two seem to be similar in date. They have similar readings. 
um, given the same environmental dose rate, which is affecting all those features on that hillside. So the, the upper two seem to be more or less the same date. The lower one seems to be younger. So, but until we've processed it and put it through the, uh, the dating technique back in the lab, we won't actually get calendar dates with an error range probably for several months. But I'll let you know, Wang Chong, when the results come out. But the technique is very robust. Yeah, it's been used in many locations so far uh, around the Mediterranean and in Arabia and in Africa, and it works quite consistently. We, there is a situation that we discussed previously where is maybe one in four samples might not give a very clear result, which is why we always sample multiple terrace, terraces in any given sequence, because sometimes you would just get a, a, a contaminated sample because of disturbance or whatever it might be in the past, Mi mixing of the sediment. Yeah, so that's why we sample multiple terraces. So we don't just finish up with one result. One date is never um, satisfactory evidence for archaeologists to, to, to make big claims about the dating of a whole landscape. Okay, we have several um, questions from the audience. We probably do it one by one. Okay, the first question is from Tiffany Mark. So I would like to ask, as these upland terraces may have been used for agricultural purposes in the past, is the project also collecting charges, seeds, and possibility radiocarbon dating of them? I mean, the, 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 the primary purpose of our, of our sampling is for OSL PD dating, but we are taking bulk samples as well, and those bulk samples could be retained and used by others for sampling. I, I, this is why I'm asking you guys to answer this question. Yeah, I mean, there are some bulk samples, small bulk samples, which are collected at the same time, uh, mainly to inform the luminescence dating procedure, but they could be screened uh, to see if there's any uh, carbonized or other plant remains present in the sediment. So I think some of that material is likely to be retained. If the dates produced are interesting and useful, then we could potentially assess some of that material. That's not the primary objective of this specific project. Uh, and I think it would be sensible to undertake a further project to do that more thoroughly using a wider range of methods because we now have a, a range of different techniques for archaeobotanical, archaeogenetic and geochemical methods that we could apply to look at that question. Um, so I think that would be uh, you know, a, a, a more a, a, a different type of project or another project which would have a, a, a wider research objective. Thank you, Professor. And there's another question, and there's asking, what is the significance of remote sensing? Uh, the, the significance of remote sensing. <laughs> On a very simple level, it allows me to be in Newcastle and to study Hong Kong's landscape um, remotely. The remote sensing um, involves a range of techniques which provide complementary evidence. And by using a range of techniques, we can overcome some of the limitations of each individual uh, methodology. So by using LIDAR, by using old aerial photographs, by using satellite imagery such as Google Earth, by using old maps even, these all t provide different strands and types of information. So the remote sensing is a means of identifying uh, features of interest in the landscape, cultural uh, elements such as terraced field systems that we might then target and go into the field to ground truth, identify, and then sample if we think they're interesting and suitable for further archaeological work. Sam wants to add something to that answer. Only I think Mick hasn't said this only because it's because he works with this data so much that it's very obvious to him. <laughs> but 
it may not be totally obvious to everybody, is that that remote sensing data enables you to see the whole landscape, the, in, the entirety of the landscape on a very large scale. And so it's possible to map the distribution of these ancient features on a very large scale, looking at big areas. So we can see that we're not dealing only with specific single isolated archaeological sites. We're dealing with a, a landscape which has uh, cultural activity all across it. And that's quite an important point to remember. That it's very comes through very strongly from the remote sensing evidence as also from the use of the historic cartography, the historic map evidence. It allows us to see that we have a, a you know a historic landscape which is covering the whole of the whole of Hong Kong, not just individual spots on a map. And so that means that we need ways to think about that landscape, to think about how to uh, manage it uh, and uh, how to understand it and how to think about it as a resource, for example, that we can uh, use for responding to climate change in the future or for other uh, large-scale challenges. Something more specific to add to that as well, just on a very simple level. These high mountain terraces are all along the north slope, north sloping ridges and spine of Lantau Island. They're along the north facing ridges and slopes of the high mountains of the central NT Massif. But if you compare the one to 1,000 map two meter contours with the layout of the terraces in those two areas, they are fundamentally different. The Lantau terraces follow the contours. In other words, the upper surfaces are horizontal, so this is just using remote sensing map and uh, aerial photographic evidence. The ones on Lantau follow the terraces, they're horizontal. The ones on Taimo Shan, all the way to Grassy Hill, go up and down across the terraces, across the contours. So they're free draining. They're draining the water away with central channels in some places, taking the excess water down the slope. The ones on Lantau are some, somehow different, which is why, if we possibly could, we'd like to sample the ones on Nailak San as well, even though it's logistically a very difficult place to get to. OK, I got one more question from the online. Is that uh, how reliable, accurate is the dating result? So it's simple just to answer that in terms of a percentage. Uh, in a well bleached sample that has perfect quartz, you'd have an error of about 5%. In a badly bleached sample with pure quartz behavior, it could be 15% or more of age. So if these are 500 years old, you could expect an error of 50 years or less. Okay, that's all from from the, of the question from the on air. Any more question? Okay. Uh, I want to ask Professor Sam. In your PowerPoint slide, you show two image. One is digital elevation modeling, and one is digital digital surface modeling to study the elevation change. Uh, over a period. So I want to know uh, what exact. Uh, what the exact model uh, you use to study the elevation change, a uh, surface model or elevation model? Okay. Uh, so th those two images, one was from 2020, one was from 1978. The one from 2020 was generated from the uh, Catalan government in Spain's LIDAR survey. And the one in 1978 was generated from high resolution aerial photography using photogrammetry. So one is photogrammetric, one is from the LIDAR, and we compared the two. But we can identify known points in both models, which are still the same height, so we can make sure that we have an accurate comparison between the two data sets. Okay, thank you.
Okay, then let's get a big round of applause for our speaker, Professor Sam Turner, Dr. Tim Kinnaird, and Dr. Mike Alva. Please stay tuned on our latest announcement regarding the upcoming education activity, and thank you very much for coming here today. <laughs>